Hey everyone, welcome to another show of Freedom Solutions. Uh, we're going to go into a new series today uh, and talk about first principles. First principles are foundational. They're going to help us orient our thinking. They're going to help us ensure that our downstream solutions uh, actually make sense and that they're you know testable, that they're provable, that they're highly functional, uh, they align with science, uh, the laws of physics, <laughs> psychology, uh, how people behave, etc. So um, as an example, uh, one of the most important first principles is the non-aggression principle or NAP. And NAP basically defines that any initiation of force is immoral because no one prefers it. So no one, no human being prefers for force to be initiated upon them, right? So, so obviously someone wouldn't want to uh, be murdered, right? Uh, we don't want to be stolen from. We, um, we can certainly defend ourselves, right? So we can use actions that uh, apply force after the initiation of force well, we can never initiate force and be moral, right, or be, be valid. And so um, as an example of why these are so important is once you understand these first principles, things like NAP, et cetera, then you can solve all sorts of downstream solutions and understand all sorts of downstream consequences. So um, an example of NAP is, is really, or the violation of NAP is the government. So uh, government's a perfect example of the initiation of force, uh, just something as simple as taxation. So taxation, regardless of whether or not it's this Robin Hood story of you know taking from the rich to give to the poor, um, the initiation of force to take from someone and give to another, regardless of even if it you know made that other person's life uh, immeasurably better, it is wrong because you've stolen from someone else so you're basically just saying that these two actors are not the same and that one deserves to get um you know violated or the for or force initiated against them through taxation and the other person randomly doesn't it's just it's it's not universalized right so you can't universally say that i deserve to be stolen from and you don't right that's just crazy, right? There's no found, there's no logic there. There's no math there. You can't just say, Hey, I'm going to take from, from integer one Mraz and give to integer two random person on, in the world, right? It just, it just doesn't make any sense. It violates the essence of that person, right? Because you're taking from their past. And we'll get into some of the details of this, but, um, this particular principle that we're going into is not about NAP, although, um, you could certainly say it's related to NAP um, in the sense that almost everything we do as humans via actions either are violating NAP, thus violence, or um, aligning with NAP, not aggression principle again, which is not violence. It's, so it's, it's freedom of exchange, it's uh, how you met your wife, it's how you uh, choose your friends, it's how you pick your career, it's how you live your life, right? That's NAP is the expression of the mathematical formula for freedom, right? So um, we'll go into these things in more depth and I'll do, uh, uh, this is an entire series, so this is just one episode of, of a foundational principle and we'll, we'll go into more. So before I actually go into the first principle, that we're going to start with for the genesis of the series. I want to talk a little bit about the show. So um, I, uh, I'm seeing pretty good traction and certainly from the people that are interested in the show, uh, I'm hearing a lot of great feedback and a lot of you guys are interested in helping, which is which is tremendous. I, 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 can't, I can't wait to start to collaborate with people and get some of these things uh, moving forward. Um, we've gotten uh, one of the important things we need to do is, is get some uh, people to subscribe to the YouTube show so I can change this glaring YouTube slash channel slash blah, 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 gobbledygook at the end to something that actually has a, a real name. Apparently, YouTube has a limitation that you have to have 100 subscribers in order to actually name your channel. Yay. In terms of URL, right? In terms of actually following URL path. So um, definitely subscribe, please and encourage other people to subscribe. 
uh, so we can you know take care of some basic stuff and then from there um, I also received a couple of donations which thank you guys so much that helps prove out the business model behind the show and the fact that I can um, do these things while being accountable to you and no one else right the goal here is that this is uh, my only focus uh, in life long term and um, that I'm here to serve you guys and help build these solutions and collaborate and bring them to the marketplace. And if I have to take advertising or I, I just won't do the show, right? If I have to, have to take advertising, because then I'm not accountable to you guys, I'm accountable to someone else. And and uh, that's just a slippery slope. And then thus my arguments fall flat on their face. So um, I, uh, I encourage you guys to help support the show, feel the show, subscribe, like, share, uh, Please donate. It helps obviously fund the show. I'm going to spend this donations. I just got to actually buy a, a proper microphone and a proper webcam. So <laughs> uh, production values are going up. Anyway, without further ado, we're going to get into the actual uh, episode topics here. So what is our first principle, right? So what, what is the first principle we're going to start with? So what is the genesis of this series? Um, the genesis is that systems are stronger than ideas. And I kind of chose the word stronger because there's all sorts of um, potentially logical arguments here around how if I were to say that systems are more important than ideas, that a system is predicated on ideas and thus I, you know, basically have a self-dating argument and, and wouldn't be very rational. Um, uh, so so I, my point is that they're stronger, they're more influential, and I'm going to get into the reason why. But the, the whole idea is, is that while I can communicate ideas, and lots of people have communicated lots of great ideas throughout the existence of man, we still use violence against each other, right? So we're still kind of not getting it for some reason. And I think the real reason is not just because there's not a ubiquitous understanding of NAP or people don't know what it means or they don't know how to apply it in their life or any of these other kind of examples. I think it really is that human beings, based on, on evidence, which we'll go into, are really just creatures of incentives and disincentives, right? Which is what really makes up the system. And so we follow the flow, so to speak. Um, regardless of our moral fortitude. So uh, there was a, you know, one of the, one of the most impactful things I think in my life um, was I was in this critical thinking class in college. And to my surprise, um, there was a multitude of people who had not ever heard of critical thinking. Now, I mean, they may have heard the term logic, critical thinking in the past, but they really didn't understand what it meant in their college, right? <laughs> Which blew my mind. And, um, and and they, they got their first dose of kind of rational thinking. And, you know, the, one of the first questions they asked um, early on was, how much money would it take for you to break your morals or to compromise your morals, right? And I, it was really impactful because you could see across the landscape people um, postulating, you know, they're trying to be like, oh, yeah, well... I would never break my morals, blah, 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 and all this other sort of stuff. And I would, I would, I would never ever follow an incentive, um, that would conflict with my ideas and all this other sort of stuff. So you saw a lot of that, you know, kind of when people would speak up. And of course I knew that was all bullshit because <laughs> I'm sitting here like seeing people, um, letting other people die in the street, you know, because they're afraid to interact with, uh, an aggressor, right? So I mean, it's just, anyway, just these people are just crap. Oh, crap. So anyway, you could see this, that people will outwardly say, I will follow my morals uh, regardless of consequences. And of course, that's not true because we'd all be dead already. Right. It's just irrational in the current system. Right. So like there's no way in a violent centric system to necessarily be 100 percent moral actor uh, because you're responding to the various incentives like you know, welfare, which expands the violence apparatus to steal from someone else to give to you, um, or, you know, direct disincentives, which are, you know, well, I'm not going to kind of pursue my morals because if I did, like, you know, avoid 
paying taxes because I don't want to fund foreign wars and killing people or, you know, just atrocious laws or, or creating uh, barriers to entry to, to building a corporation or et cetera. Anything you didn't believe in in government, if you said, hey, I'm not going to pay these taxes, uh, you, you, you would be disincentivized to into death, <laughs> right? Like the end game here is if you if you don't comply to a large extent of these systems like taxation, et cetera, uh, you're dead, right? I mean, just, you know, give enough time and men with guns will come to your home after, a, uh, you know, maybe a year or two or three of ignoring your taxes bill and uh, they'll eventually come to, you know, lock you up so you can comply with the tax code or take your assets, right? So anyway, and then and of course, you know, a rational person would, would have every right to defend themselves. But in this irrational world, there's no endless stream of immoral agents to come to your home and take your stuff. So you're just never going to win that. So the whole point is that in the coercive environment that we live in today, it doesn't make sense for you to always follow your moral fortitude anyway. Now, again, I'm not saying that there isn't ways around some of these systems. You have to make sacrifices, of course, right? So you can't be at a normal standard of living and participate in this system, right? So, so the, the classic quote from a lot of people are, well, if you don't like it, you know, go leave or go live uh, in Alaska and subsistence live. Well, I've done that and it's fun. <laughs> but, um, but the whole point is that that's not for everyone. And that is also not really a moral answer. You can't just say, well, if you don't like violence, uh, run like hell and hope that you avoid violence like that it just makes no sense and if you applied it logically or universally to uh, all parties including the person saying that you it would be irrational because then you could say well i'm going to initiate violence against you for telling me for for saying that my only way to risk mitigate my violence is to run away from you well no i'm just gonna you know i'm just gonna initiate violence against you so you don't even get a chance to say that right um, anyway, so, so the whole point is, is that there is no rational way of applying morals universally and all the time in our current system, which is why we're going to change it, right? So there is answers coming, and I'm going to get to those in a minute. But I want to start to give some very tangible ideas and understanding of why people follow systems and they don't just follow ideas, right? And, and this is right. It's, it's just it's incentives and disincentives. So, um, again, you, you know, the whole point is basically incentives drive most people's actions. Um, and, and then you got to consider, too, that if you have an incentive and your choice is incentive or disincentive, you, you got to kind of want to play the game. Right. It goes back to the whole quote of, you know, don't hate the play, I hate the game, right? It's it's the fact that if I have an incentive of getting welfare versus getting my face bashed in <laughs> because I'm not participating in the system, which one is most people going to choose? Now, there may be exceptions, and there are, you know, uh, everyone gets to choose their level of participation in the system um, to some degree, but it you're, you're not, it's not where it should be, right? It's not where it's 100% voluntary and you get to choose what system you want to be a part of and what system you don't want to be a part of, right? And then the only universal thing we have to follow is the non-initiation force because everyone agrees that initiating force against someone else, theft, murder, uh, you know, uh, st uh, so basically theft, murder, um, freedom of speech, stealing someone's freedom in the moment, in the present is all wrong. Right. And that's that's immoral. And no one would agree to it because no one would say, yeah, hey, do that to me. Right. If you're not willing to say, yeah, I'm OK, do that to me, then clearly it's not universalizable. Right. Uh, anyway, so so that's the whole point. People, regardless of ideas and how great they are and how accurate they are and everything else, they're going to follow systems until the systems change. And that's largely why I built the show. And we'll go into it more details on how we're going to solve all this uh, as we go along. But I want to get the, I want to get the principles out. I want to get the concepts out. I want to build the foundation so we can reorient our thinking. So um, I went to a couple examples of this, but um, you know, one, one of the things that really struck me when I started really delving into this when I was young um, was the fact that NEP has been around for a long time, like 
1600s, John Locke kind of coined the original concept of non-aggression principle, um, how it's immoral to initiate force, etc. And of course, Ayn Rand really made it popular, right? It made it kind of more common, more part of culture, and uh, much, much wider spread. And now, of course, um, people like Stefan Molyneux and a lot of others are are really getting moving the needle even more, right? Which is all great. But if it's existed for that long, <laughs> since the 1600s, and again, you know, it really hasn't moved the needle, then we must be doing something wrong, right? We're, we're obviously banging our heads against ideological concepts that we want everybody to understand and follow without building the systems to follow them, right? And so historically, the way people would follow these systems, we did it through religion or through imperialis uh, empiricism, uh, sorry, not imperialism, imperialism or government, now governments, right? Republics, uh, democracies, etc. And all you got to do is build a proper system of, of free markets, right? And solutions which basically reduce or remove the need for what other people who people don't understand non-aggression, who don't understand philosophy and critical thinking and all these ideas, they can follow the incentives of more revenue, right? More, more, more money in their pocket, which increases their survival, etc. So how do we do that is by free market solutions. Obviously, free markets and innovations in the free markets make people better off, right? So um, the whole point of all of this is to talk about why systems are stronger, right? Systems are obviously more stronger because they have a direct incentive we're building solutions with incentives, not disincentives. The disincentive really comes in a, in another um, form of ostracism, which we'll get into in a minute. But again, when you build all these these systems to incentivize good behavior, people will follow regardless of whether they understand the ideas. You don't need them to understand the ideas. They're going to follow it because they're like, hey, I'll make more money in the free market than I do in the violent fiat market, right? The government control market. So we're going to you know, more details on that in a minute. But anyway, again, so the whole point is systems are much stronger at changing behavior than in just ideas, right? Um, and, and another concept I want to go into, which is, I think, important to understand uh, systems. I kind of hinted at it earlier, but basically the word violence has been abused <laughs> over the years. So if you look at the entomology, you can go all the way back to the Greeks. And the Greeks defined violence as as uh, violare, violare. Um, I'm sure I'm murdering that, that, that pronunciation. But the idea is, is basically the, the definition that they had was to violate, right? It, it meant it encompassed this broad spectrum of verbal abuse, um, physical abuse, so, you know, direct physical violence, uh, it, you know, freedom, all these other concepts, because it, it was too violate. And if you understand that basic comp, comp uh, that basic idea of if you violate someone, you're doing, you're doing one of three things. You're either stealing from one's past, which is the wealth, right? The ability to accumulate resources to, to ensure their survival, right? That's, that's all money is. That's all wealth is. You're stealing from their present, which is their freedom. Their ability to, you know, discuss ideas in public, their ability to conduct trade, their ability to, you know, build a business. So all these other nonviolent ways of collaborating with other human beings and making everyone else's life better or everyone's life better, right? Yours and everyone else's and, 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 and or theft of the future, right? So they're stealing your life. They're, you know, uh, indebting our children, you, you know, all these other stuff. So like, there's, it's one of these three basic constructs. Either everything that is violence is a theft of one's past, their present, or their future, right? And, and the Greeks understood this. And this is, it, it's, it's lost to time because it, it's not, it's not beneficial to the people who run the system today of government to basically have everyone have a dialogue that includes words that actually make sense. So now violence has become nothing but physical interaction in a negative way, supposedly. I mean, like, like a lot of people consider boxing violence. It's not violence. Two combatants or more chose to enter the ring together to test their skills or potentially, you know, showcase their skills. And that's voluntary. It's a choice, right? So nothing voluntary 
can ever be violence. And so, we, but we've changed the words, so now everyone's confused, and no one knows what the hell anyone's talking about, and and then and everybody's afraid to use the word violence because they're like, oh, it's it's uh, it's it's just an emotional word, and it has no meaning, like. And it drives me nuts, right? It drives me nuts. It's one of the, why the key principles of philosophy is the understanding of words and why that's so impactful. Because if you can't have a common word or language or dialogue, then no one will ever understand each other anyway. And that's, that's really the goal of the system today, right? Is to make sure we don't understand each other. We can't collaborate with each other. And there's no unity. <laughs> because if you can keep the, if you keep the, the cattle kind of segregated into their own different herds or potentially hate each other or whatever else or fight each other, um, then, <laughs> then they don't have to do as much work to keep us under control, right? So anyway, it's just important to understand these, these kind of key principles as you understand that, um, the, this, this really foundational principle that systems are more impactful than ideas is that, um, violence is the major disincentivizer in us, in our systems today, right? And the major incentive is free shit, right? It's, hey, I'll give you entertainment. So I'll give you, uh, free stuff. I'll give you welfare. I'll give you lots of stuff. I'll put on a show every four years that will pretend like we're giving you a choice. These are all incentives, right? For you not to change the system. And, uh, we're going to change the system, right? That's the whole point. So anyway, uh, <laughs> I put a little asterisk down here. Um, my asterisk generally denote that government or at least some sort of political party has bastardized a word over time, uh, trying to brainwash people into believing it's something that it's not. Um, so thus the word physics and, or sorry, thus the word violence and law do not mean what the hell you think they mean. Law is an immutable fact. It, it, it is not, it is not the laws we follow that some ruler has put in place laws only apply to physics so let's stop using a stupid term to describe uh, a scenario where someone's using violence to enforce their opinion law today is just opinion with a gun it's all it is it's all it is violence is the the whole gamut that i went into theft of one's past present and future so anyway, those are important to understand those definitions. It's important to understand the history. And even if you disagree, like, like there's a lot of people who say, well, you know, words evolve and, and all this other stuff, which is also bullshit. And we can kind of go into that in a different, um, in a different first principles video on, on the etymology of words and, you know, why they, they don't really change. They just get abused and all this other stuff. But the whole point is, is that regardless of whether you, you agree that the word violence means that the one's past, present, or future, and that laws only apply to physics. Uh, my point is, whatever you call those words, whether, uh, the, the, whatever, whatever you identify those constructs with, whether it's the word violence or the word force or, you know, whether it's laws or physics or whatever, those concepts are what, in, what's important to understand here and apply to the system, right? So, um, we're not here to get in an argument over semantics. That's irrelevant. But the point is, is that when I say the word violence, I mean theft of one's past, present, or future. When I say the word law, and thus I'm using the current context, I really mean physics. Um, when I say law in the present context, I really mean opinion with a gun, right? So it's important to understand these things uh, to understand the principle that systems are stronger than ideas. All right, so we talked a lot about what the system is, um, what is a system in general, you know, and what's some of the problems that exist today. Well, how do we solve it? It's actually pretty easy, ironically. <laughs> um, like, like most things that are correct, once you get them to an atomic level, uh, it's binary, right? So it's easy to understand an argument when you get to, when you strip away the, all the layers of irrelevance and uh bullshit right and you get to the root of an argument the 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 essence of an argument it becomes really simple right it's just it's just, just like anything in science it's in anything in any sort of logical discipline once you get to the essence of something all the answers become really easy it becomes easy to communicate it's it's a really simple um it, be, it has really simple outcomes you know, once you understand. So anyway, so how do we actually solve this? Well, we solve it through decentralization, right? So 
if the initiation of force is only capable of really surviving when it's centralized with a bunch of resources and a monopoly on power and violence and everything else in a centralized apparatus like the government, then the, its opposite will 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 cause this, the you know the the opposite result, right? So it will cause cause the the centralization of violence, cause the I guess the application of violence today to dissolve. So on an individual level, no one goes around and says, you know, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go to you, I'm gonna take your wallet, or very few people do, right? I'm gonna take your wallet and I'm gonna run with it. I'm gonna steal from you. And then I'm going to give it to this guy over here because, you know, I think he deserves it more than you. Or like, which is never, it rarely happens. And, and certainly if you told someone, they would generally defend themselves, right? So when you get to a more individual level, at the very minimum, the amount of predation that can go on or the amount of violence that could be exacted on people is almost immeasurable. It's, it's almost zero, right? It's, it's, it's irrelevant. And, um, that's what we need to do. So we need to start building systems which incentivize individuals to um, build solutions that are, you know, that are that are basically driving um, nonviolence in the free market, right? Versus building a bunch of uh, violent-based disincentives and violent based incentives which is kind of the current government monopoly right and so so what we do is we expand the free market through decentralization and decentralization is really the individual in action right so um if i trade with you and we're both better off then uh that is a beneficial action to both parties that's a non-violent interaction to both parties that's a voluntaristic interaction between both parties and the world is now better right and now that productive use of my exchange with your exchange has removed yet another piece of value that currently sits in the violence market and puts it in the freedom market right so every freedom solution we build actually takes away power and capital meaning you know real wealth and violence from the centralized violence apparatus of government so the centralization the collectivism all this sort of stuff so every time we build something that's freedom centric we're actually chipping away at at that apparatus right um so what we do is we chip away at the pieces that are super important, right? Things like um, safety. Why is everybody chase after government? Or why, why does everybody think government's legitimate? Because they want to be safe. They want their mother and their father to protect them. So they've built this hierarchical system, which they project their insecurities on, you know, and, which is basically projecting their mother and father and the roles of their mother and father into government. And they're saying, protect me, coddle me, take care of me, all this other stuff, right? Um, which, which just shows that they're abused, they're immature, they're irrational, and that they, they don't have, you know, j the capability to, um, reason their way out of the scenario that they're in, and this is the system uh, that they're in, right? And so we got to build a system that gives them an alternative. Um, and so as we go into these basic things like safety um, and all these other kind of biological imperatives that we have as human beings, it's important to understand why they exist. And so one of the key principles or sub principles um, that you have to understand is, is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. He's done a great job and I've used this and I've applied this through um, as a first principle from everything from um, having a conversation with someone all the way to building a uh, user experience in a system, right? If, as soon as you understand these concepts, then you understand why humans behave the way that they do in a system, in a violent system, and how they behave in a, in a nonviolent system, right? So if you look at the basic foundation built, foundational building blocks, the, the, the bottom of the pyramid is the biological, right? So, um, do I have enough food? Uh, to eat, do is my healthcare taken care of? Like, is my arm broken? Is it not broken? Is it? Uh, can I see? Can I not see? Uh, 
can I speak, can I not speak, can I, you know, all these other basic motor functions, basic biological functions are paramount because if you don't do those, you can't do anything else, right? You can't be safe, you can't communicate, you don't care about being confident and you know, really don't give a damn about your persona or your projection or or um, what you're doing in life to make the world better, right? So, so anyway, so what we do is we start to attack so to speak, uh, we, we, we start to build solutions for each one of these as we go along. So we build a decentralized solution, which enables um, access to food. And I don't, I don't mean, you know, free food, but I, mean, I mean like access, like free markets. So we remove the overhead, remove the violence, remove the, the, the barrier to entry to these types of scenarios, right? So there's a lot of these things already going on. There's like community um, farming, initiatives there's uh, a lot of movement in um, decentralized agriculture where you're building your own farms managing your own farms growing your own food this is all great stuff right this makes this decentralizes the problem this this starts to remove um, from the current violent system the means of sustaining the biological right the, the foundation by which we operate all of us right so if we have to go to the bathroom we're going to stop what we're going to what we're doing and we're going to go to the bathroom, right? That's, that's a biological imperative that uh, usurps everything, including sex, right? So, <laughs> and anyway, so the whole point is, is um, once you solve for these foundational components, you, you can start to move on to the next layer, right? So y y the next one is health. So at, what we need to start doing is we need to start building more and more free markets so we can exchange food, exchange, uh, medical solutions, exchange everything ultimately. But as we build out the foundation, then we can start to move forward to the next pieces, um, like physical safety. So the reason why I think things like UberGuard, where we basically build a decentralized marketplace for safety, so like things like bodyguards that are relatively inexpensive, maybe it's your neighbor, maybe it's your friend, maybe it's a college kid, and you know they're getting paid to, to defend you in a real-time scenario by being nearby or right next to you, <laughs> which is the only way to keep yourself safe, or yourself, like if you defend yourself, that's, a perfect, that's probably the best scenario, but not everybody's capable of it, and not everybody wants to. Not, not everybody has the personality to carry a gun all the time, to uh, learn martial arts and all this other stuff, right? They, it is what it is. It's a free market. You have choice. But everyone wants to be safe. And let's build a solution that, that actually makes them safe, right? As opposed to the bullshit we have now, which is, is not safe, right? Um, it's, it's, it's a response to violence, not the defense of violence, right? Um, there's lots of reasons for that, but that's another show, <laughs> uh, in terms of why it exists today. Um, you know, and so we go into this, we go into UberGuard, we build UberGuard, we build, um, properly free markets, right? Proper free markets. We're this a whole other show. We'll go into it. Uh, free currencies are already starting to be built, right? So we have Bitcoin. Um, we have solutions wrapped around agorism where, you know, obviously it's trade, uh, sur trade of services, trades of goods which of course been around a long time but you know now we can layer this into the overall solution we can have um community in the sense of you know how, how do we ensure free speech how do we ensure people can collaborate this is this is one important component of of, of maslow's hierarchy of needs is that we all need to feel like we're, we're we're still tribal right we're still herd animals we still flock together and it doesn't mean that we're not individuals Right. That's that's the beauty that makes human beings so unique is that we are our unique snowflakes. Right. Where every one of us is an individual that brings its own value into this world. But the symbiotic exchange of value between us and our other humans helps also make us uh better right because it, it increases our survival so like if i trade with someone else who has another specialization maybe he invented the wheel and i invented uh the bucket right the the, the cart that goes on top of the wheel then we've exchanged that we've amplified exponentially our value together right so it's that community that drives survival right and one, one of the key principles here to understand is that literally every single thing we do in life everything is to ensure our survival of our genes, right? And it's important, like everything, the biological, the physical safety, uh, part of community, confidence, uh, the self, all this stuff, 
all abstractions for ensuring your genes survive, right? It's why we breed, it's why we eat, it's why we collaborate in business, it's, it's you know, why we do everything. It's all foundational to that one root driver that we want to ensure our genetic survival, right? And so once you understand these kind of basic principles and you understand how they impact systems, then you have the answers, right? Then you automatically know what we need to do to go solve the problem. So anyway, going along this, this pyramid of, of, of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is really should be hierarchy uh, or, or really hierarchy of survival, it's a, you know, all of the roads lead back to survival, is, is, is confidence, right? So the next component of his pyramid is really confidence. Now, he uses a couple different words here to describe it, but basically the reality is, is how do we instill confidence, right? So we're all solutions focused. So this entire show is not just about principles, but it's how to actually get to these principles and make them tangible and realize them to today, not, you know, 20 years from now. And so, um, again, you know, how we solve building more confidence in people. This is something that I think, uh, again, Stefan Molyneux does a really good job with, which is wrapped around peaceful parenting. Uh, it's a great answer. So, so if you teach your kids to negotiate, you teach your kids to collaborate, you teach your kids to not use violence, and you sh you show them that by negotiating with them and not dogmatically telling them what to do, then you build much better people who are focused on negotiating and win-win scenarios instead of win-lose scenarios, right? So it's super important. It's a solution. That is an actual solution, right? Um, you build a system of ostracism. It's another thing that Stefan, Mo Stefan Molly goes into and he's, he does a really good job of, of, of talking about ostracism and how we can socially organize people in a nonviolent way to not initiate force against each other, right? By not trading with people who initiate force, by not associating with people who use force, by not breeding with people who use force, right, etc. Um, DROs, dispute resolution orgs. We'll have a whole other topic on that one. So just understand that it's basically a third party, which is getting to the bottom of things, so to speak, and is you, you both mutually agreed to while entering to a contract, and they're going to arbitrate, right? It's it happens today, like exists today, it's a system that exists today, but it needs to be universally applied and we're going to build a decentralized system for it, which basically creates a marketplace for it and really, you know, a really simple mobile app where people can engage in the DRO ecosystem without having to go through a lot of complex understanding of what the hell it means, right? Um, and again, all this stuff breeds confidence, right? All these solutions breeds confidence in the individual that they can solve problems, that they can negotiate their way through life, and they don't have to resort to violence, and they don't have to resort to a third party who's going to do violence for them, like the government, right? Um, so the self, this is, this is a very important concept, right? So the, the idea is your ability to choose. The self is really about choice. It's really all about can we build systems which enable you to truly choose your destiny, choose your life, choose the things you want to pursue, etc. And I think the best way to do this is by reducing barrier to entry. I have this um, this kind of uh, talk track or this this topic I talk about, uh, which is which is basically wrapped around the fact that everyone's an entrepreneur and they just don't know it yet, right? Because they look at entrepreneurship and they look at startups and they look at business and they look at all these things and they're like, oh my God, there's so much to understand. There's so much to know. There's, it's so hard. It's so risky, right? It's, it's, I have to invest. I have to do all this other stuff. I have to, I have to eat top ramen for years. And, 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 and yeah, maybe that's true, depending upon what business you're going after and all this other stuff. But what they don't realize is that it's, it's really not that hard when you are pursuing something you love. And, Pursuing something you love is easy to do if there wasn't violence involved in the ecosystem, right? So if there wasn't this scenario system of licensure and regulations and taxation and all these other things would totally screw over your business model, um, it, we're, the world would be so much easier. And so we're building these today. Right. So we're, we're building these peer to peer platforms. We're building um, cryptocurrency platforms that are enabling free free uh freedom of of ideas and the ability to see these ideas into the marketplace w without a lot of the 
you know, without a lot of the barriers to entry, a lot of the violence that's in place today. So like you can go build a decentralized autonomous organization, which is, you know, basically a software piece of software that runs kind of automatically in the cloud, so to speak, or in the in the peer to peer cloud. And there's no one to stop you and you can still make money. You can still make revenue and you can still reap a reward and everything else for your labor. And, uh, and that's the beauty of, of where we're going. So, so technologies like cryptocurrencies and, um, peer to peer, uh, software frameworks have really built this new world where you can be anonymous and be the next Bill Gates, right? I mean, so that's the whole point is we got to build more of these systems that enable people to escape the violence world, still build the things that they're passionate about, be able to, you know, take care of their needs and incentivize them through a profit motive to build new solutions without people attacking them. <laughs> or uh, so. So that's that's our goal. Right. And we're going to we're going to keep building these solutions until that happens. So how do we mitigate risk in this new system? Right. So we, I've talked a lot about um, systems being stronger than ideas, uh, a, basically affecting change faster than ideas. I've shown some examples of why and I've given some historical examples of why ideas have, um, have not necessarily changed the world for the better yet. Um, and why, why I think systems will, will really do this. Um, but, but how do we risk mitigate in this new world? So a lot of people are apprehensive about building a system of complete freedom because they're concerned about, well, how do we stop crazy people? <laughs> right. And, and I think it's again, they don't fully understand the ideas. And so what we say is, okay, well, we can certainly explain to you how these work, but more importantly, why don't we actually just build a system which enforces these concepts through incentives and disincentives? So the disincentive side of a free market and a, and a non-aggression system, principle-based system is ostracism, right? So it's the idea that people fear gene death. Again, going back to what I talked about earlier, Maslow's hierarchy needs, they're all predicates of survival. Uh, they're all, sorry, they're all, um, they're, they're all basically tangents off of the core goal, which is survival, right? And so again, survival of your genes to, to multiply, to go into, to obviously reproduce and to carry on. And so everything else we do is in service of that goal. And when we get, when we say, Hey, we're going to use ostracism. So we're going to socially reorient with nonviolence by either producing ideas, or producing systems or um, following principles like uh, I, you know, again, like I mentioned earlier, I won't breed with you if you use violence. I won't associate with you if you use violence. I won't trade with you if you use violence. Then we start to really solve these. So if we can make those tangible inside a solution, something like um, a DRO or a reputation system or whatever, right, then we can actually start to build real systems that have tangible effects on ostracism and give a solution of arbitration, which is DROs. And then we can actually move the needle forward as opposed to just hoping that people get the ideas and the concepts, right? So again, this is all about building systems that actually impact freedom today with tangible solutions, not hoping that in three generations, that the violent people die off and we've peaceful parented uh, enough people that we all take up freedom solutions and we all understand the concepts and we all live peacefully because we all get it. That's, I just don't see that happening anytime soon. It, it probably will happen, but I think it's, I think it may be 15, 20 generations if we just let ideas run with it, right? I think uh, if we built systems, then the systems will drive behavior before people fully understand the ideas. And then once they realize they're benefiting more by a nonviolent ecosystem, like, you know, getting more money, which increases their survival, their ability to survive, uh, change, all this sort of stuff. Then you're like, Oh, these people were right. Let's, 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 let's stop abusing our kids. Let's stop using violence against other people. Let's stop begging a third party called government to go beat the shit out of our neighbor for an opinion that I have. Right. So anyway, the whole point is, as we start to build these systems, 
then the tangible results are real, they're measurable, um, and in, and they're, and, and they're actual, right? So like when money starts to move from the violent system into the free market, then no one really cares about the violent system because it's, it no longer is able to fund itself, right? So anyway, these systems will bring us tangible, uh, freedom, like really soon. <laughs> I, I'd say within years, if we build these up piece by piece, um, and see them in the marketplace, I think we could see it within our lifetime, right? So, um, what's important? So, so there's some important links. Um, I just want to kind of wrap up with harping on the topic of peaceful parenting because I do feel it is a system in itself. I do feel it's one of the most paramount things that we do. Um, and uh, I wanted to give some links to it. I wanted to talk about the fact that peaceful parenting is really the foundation by which adults become uh basically they so their childhood your childhood is the foundation which really describes who you are it's really going to define who you are so like when the first four maybe five years your personality is fully formed and you are who you are from then on out right and this is all scientifically proven you can see all sorts of stuff i'll link you to this, uh, lots of the links and the the evidence and the studies are in this link here uh, Stefan Molling's doing a lot of great work on this. And, and obviously, you know, he's really doing, uh, kind of bringing it to the forefront, but there's tons of scientists that have spent decades on this topic, right? And hundreds of them. So it's, it's pretty well understood that by age five, you are who you are and everything else is just learning wisdom, so to speak, right? Knowledge, skills, et cetera, uh, experience. And then, so, if we build, if we start building this foundation of peaceful parenting, in addition to these systems, like these technological systems that I'm talking about, that the show is focused on, then we can really start to see major, major impacts in less than a generation across the planet and, uh, and really just, and, and actually change the course of history, right? So I see, I see this area as being, or this, this time period, this era as an, as another epoch, right? So, you know, there, there's been a multitude of epochs, but now we're at this point where decentralization and the culmination of the advances of internet and uh, of the internet and technology and computers and everything else has now led us to decentralization. It's it's the expression of the individual in the world in the world uh, at scale, without barriers, without violence, right? And we're here. We're here now, and we're here to build it. So anyway, so check out this link, study peaceful parenting, obviously uh, parent your kids peacefully, don't abuse them, negotiate with them uh, so we can stop having this conversation over and over again, right? And, um, and we can really get to something that's more important, like, I don't know, maybe getting the human race, race off of the planet before the sun goes supernova or something, right? <laughs> anyway. Um, just wanted to wrap up with that so you guys can go do some more research into peaceful parenting. I hope you guys understood or uh, like the first principles kind of construct. And I, I look forward to your feedback on, on, on basically my argument that systems are more impactful than ideas. Uh, I'd love to hear your feedback. I'd love to, um, you know, uh, talk to people who are uh, leaders, thought leaders in this particular, these particular areas and get their, get their ideas and understanding and, and kind of collaborate. And so I hope you guys will join me on this journey of building systems and, uh, you know, decentralized applications more specifically that we can put in the hands of people today so that we can start to actually affect freedom, uh, here and now and pull money and resources and people and thoughts out of the violent system and into the free market with real solutions. So join me. I, uh, I look forward to working with everyone and, and making this a reality. So uh, thank you guys so much again uh, for, you know, listening, for uh, subscribing, for sharing, for uh, collaborating with, with me on the show. Um, and again, this show is all powered by you. If you guys like, these types of topics and you you guys like the systems that we're, we're producing and the things we're going to be building. Um, you like the ability to collaborate and you want me to be 100% accountable to you. 
then fuel the show, donate, uh, share, tell me what you like, you don't like. I love engaging with people, so feel free to leave comments. Uh, email me. Uh, we actually have a call in show, call in show that we're trying to do um, where we, we talk to people about specific topics. Uh, we're going to do some interviews coming up soon, and uh, we look forward to your feedback and collaborating with you. Thank you so much. Goodbye.